You know what I can't figure out? How come the devil gets all the glory? I mean, think about it. Here he is. He's a angel, right? I mean, he's an archangel, but okay, so. He stands before God, and he's talking to God about Job. So, we know he's in one place, at one time, doing one thing, talking to God. Now, Satan gets a chance to do some things to Job that we know is kind of dramatic. So he takes some of his guys, leaves God's presence, comes down to earth, however he does it, interdimensional travel, whatever. So he afflicts Job in some ways that causes him to be afflicted and different things happen to him. But Satan isn't God. He's the God of this world, but he's an angel. He's one person. How does he get credit for doing all this stuff to everybody? I mean, okay, so maybe he, you know, kind of screwed Eve up and then wound up devastating the entire world, but that's one person he knocked down in order to do all that. In other words, how big is your Satan? I mean, is he as big as God? Is the devil like, oh, the devil and God are equal? I don't, I don't think so. You know, I mean... Personally, if he's a roaring lion, walking, walking it says, or roaming up to and fro on the earth to find someone to devour, it kind of sounds like he really doesn't have a handle on everyone all at the same time, like he's not omnipotent. How big is your Satan? How big is your devil? Well, he's got a lot of angels, you know, I mean, there's only seven billion people in the world, so, you know, I mean, I'm sure he's got that many angels to afflict every single... Really? Okay. Can you find that in the Bible for me? No, I didn't think so. So, how big is Satan? I mean, come on. The devil made me do it? Oh, yeah! Oh, I think, maybe, Satan's getting a lot of credit where credit isn't due. You know, I want to find out who the real culprit is. I mean, don't you? Don't you think that maybe there's a little more to this Satan story and conspiracy than meets the eye? I mean, I do believe that there is a Satan, don't get me wrong, and I believe that there's principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness on high places. I do believe that there's the covering angel that got cast down from heaven to the earth. I do believe that a messenger, one, was sent to Daniel, you know, to give him the answer and that some demonic activity hindered him. Couldn't stop him, but it hindered him for a while because time is our domain. Time doesn't bother God. He just operates on his own time schedule. So, though it hindered him from arriving to Daniel, the angel wanted to reassure Daniel and to reassure us that, yes, God heard Daniel's prayer as soon as he prayed it, and the answer was sent. Now, it took a little while to get there. Okay. God operating from his throne to our throne that we sit on sometimes takes a little time. But... How big is your God compared to how big is your Satan? I mean, my God, I hear people talk all the time about, well, you know, we got to deliver all these people from everything that they got delivered of, you know? I mean, frankly, you're going to tell me that all those things are being delivered of is demonic and satanic? And I think maybe since corruption came into the world and our body flesh is corrupted that maybe some of that deliverance stuff is maybe the corruption of the flesh and doesn't take a genius to figure out that hey you take a Christian and you put temptation and leave him five minutes alone and guess what nine times out of ten that Christian's gonna dive right into that temptation and make it sin <laughs> Woo the water's fine dive in Woo -hoo! boom at least they're gonna jump in enough times till they figure out there's no water in the pool then suddenly they're going to go, you know, 
there's no water in the pool. I think I'll quit diving off the diving board. That, that temptation just ain't working so well for me. So, I'm always fascinated when somebody comes along and says, Now I rebuke you, demon, or I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. And I think, how do you know it was a demon? I mean, didn't Jesus, when he rebuked any of the demons and any of the people that were possessed, didn't they cry out to him first? Didn't they speak to Jesus first? Didn't they identify themselves? Mm, yeah, I think so. So you see, I've been overseas where I am convinced there's demonic activity. But you know, I've also been in the councils of the godly where I think there's more flesh than there is spirituality. Call me a little weird. Call me a little strange. Maybe I don't have the discernment of spirits, but uh, I think the devil's getting more credit than he's due. You know, I think a lot of what people think the devil did is a bunch of doo-doo. <laughs> and we need to clean up the mess on that scripturally because, frankly, the devil isn't as strong as you think he is. He's an accuser, don't get me wrong. He can whisper, you know, and we got things that are going on in governments and people and Christians and all kinds of things that just... The wind of whispers and rumors and innuendos and suspicions and all these, like, oh, mystical things you can't put a finger on. Yeah, I could believe that that's Satan, you know. I don't have any problem with that one. You know, it's like he kind of just, you know, walks by and goes, lust. You know, and he go, yeah. Where, 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 where? Because, frankly, you know, there are a lot of people that don't deny themselves. They don't take up their cross and they don't follow Jesus like he said to. Oh, they follow Jesus, you know, as long as he's the good guy. But they don't have to do anything about it like crucify themselves, like crucify this flesh and put it down. And it isn't a question of saying, devil, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus because I'm feeling lust and I'm feeling, you know, like, like, um, hungry and I rebuke that hunger and I rebuke that thirst and I rebuke that whatever it may be. And it's just your flesh. It's the body. It's the body appetites. It's the old man. Wrecking the old man dead. Come on. Put him to death. You don't do it by rebuking somebody who didn't do it to him. <laughs> Satan's laughing. He's going, ha, I got credit for another one. Chalk that one up to me. And he's got this chalkboard baby in heaven going, ha, fool, 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 fool. Because you're always telling someone that you're doing something to Satan, and you cast it out because Satan, you think, wound up taking it away from you, you know, or you got rid of him, when in reality, you were just turning to God, and God was trying to heal your body and focus you in on himself, not yourself. Because, you see, when it's about self, it's called deny yourself. And that's it. Other than that, you're being deceived. So I'm sorry, you know. I believe there's a, such a thing as, you know, some deliverance kinds of ministries that, you know, yeah, it's a positive thing, you know, in some ways. I think mostly in all of Christianity, across the board, whether it be deliverance or Pentecostal or... Roman Catholic, or Protestant, or Fundamentalist, or even Calvary Chapels, or or Vineyards, or gosh, whatever they are, Messianic, especially Messianics, oh God, I mean, don't get me wound up. But all of them get carried away at times. They go overboard on something. It's kind of like, you know, I'll give my own example. How many times do people say, well, you know, we're Calvary Chapel, so we're teaching ministry, and yet... If we're a teaching ministry, how come somebody's up there preaching the teaching and teaching the teaching? In other words, is teaching about giving a lecture? Because that's what we get. Well, if it's about giving a lecture, then really, when we're teaching the Word of God at Calvary Chapels, we're preaching the Word and application of the Word without really divulging a type of interaction to cause the person to react and act in a way of applying that spoken word or that preached word to themselves in interactivity that causes teaching to occur. So, it's really not a Bible study. It's more like a Bible preaching. 
because most Calvary chapels that I know of are huge. And no offense to any Calvary chapels, because, you know, I am part of Calvary Chapel Ministries in a lot of ways, is that we need to be a little honest about it. You know, we're really not teaching. We're sharing what we've been taught and what we've learned and sharing that in a way that would best be described as expositional teaching? No. That's just a fancy way of saying we're preaching, but you didn't want to use that word because we're not preachers, we're teachers. No, you're not. You go to school and you tell me that you're a teacher, and I'm going to go, <laughs> right, dream on, buddy. Take me to a pastor, you know, and i tell you one thing, man. When we sit down and talk, we are teaching, you know. Being a pastor from Calvary Chapel most of the time, unless they're secure in their own faith, you know, and have a relationship of teaching, you know, and they know how. They get a little intimidated by me because it's like, ah, oh, you ain't teaching me. You're preaching. Oh, you know, and it's like, oh, well, I have my authority, you know, by the word of God. Yeah, yeah you have your authority as long as you're under the covering. You know, I'm sorry, sorry. Once you step outside of that covering and anointing, you know, that is from someone else, you know, that you might not be the teacher you think you are, but you might be preaching more than you think you know. Because in reality, a lot of times, though people are taught how to become a pastor, really a preacher, how to become a leader of their church and congregation, they're not really taught how to teach. You know, I mean, teaching is a gift and it is a ministry, and a lot of Sunday school teachers <laughs> learn that with young children because if you're interactive, you're teaching. If you're not interactive, you're preaching. They may learn, but that's the Holy Spirit doing it. So, the reality is, most of the times, people get carried away with what they say, but it isn't necessarily true what it actually works out to be. Because that's what happens with Satan. See, Satan doesn't have to come to you, every single person, and attack you personally. He doesn't have to come out and say, I gotcha! And then you go, I rebuke you, Satan, for causing me to really lust after that candy bar. That wasn't Satan. That was your flesh. But, he can start the process behind the scenes of, hey, I'm going to get society to enjoy candy bars because they're fattening and they've got all that ugh, stuff for you, you know. And so people get kind of carried away, you know, and as most people do when they indulge themselves. They don't do it in moderation. They go, hey, there's one candy bar. Let's have ten. That way we've got them in case we need them. So they buy ten candy bars and get fat. Overindulgence. No balance, and that's what happens with Christianity a lot of times. We overstate Satan, who he is. Jesus said, hey, when you see him face to face, you're going to laugh. That's Satan? He's a midget. <laughs> no offense to my wife. I call her midget. But Satan ain't no problem, you know? I mean, that's the bottom line. I mean, sure, you may get tripped up and stumbled up at times, you know, but... He can't kill you, and if he does, what are you worried about? If you die, you're going to the Lord, so frankly, he's got no authority over you, you know? You've already been purchased with a price. God is in control, not Satan, and Satan's just an angel, so if I could give you a word today to really learn from, it's like, how big is your Satan? Because he's really a little guy. <laughs> he's a midget! Don't go stomping on him. Don't worry about him. Go off and do your thing, you know? When you focus in on Jesus, you have no time for Satan and his ways. You're too busy crucifying your own flesh and caring about other people. You know, if you take care of the things that God has said to focus in on, you don't have to worry about going out and taking care of the things that the enemy is doing or that you think is so whatever. Because Jesus said that, hey, there's, there's wheat and tares growing up, you know? Just harvest the wheat. Don't worry about the tares. You know, you don't go out into the field and say, you know, the fields are white with harvest, but I think I'll go out there and take the tares out first before I harvest. That's not what he said. He said, let them grow together. Don't worry about it. Relax. God's got it in control. And if he does, I ain't worried about what you're doing and I'm doing. I'm worried about more so being faithful to what God is telling me to do as he's telling you to do the same. Be wise to the enemy. Be well balanced, for the 
that enemy of yours, the devil, roams around like a lion roaring, seeking someone to seize upon and devour. 1 Peter 5.8 Satan cannot devour just anybody he pleases. He has to find someone who gives him an opening to do so. One of the ways we give him an opening to destroy us is through imbalance in our lives. A good example would be if we eat improperly and in unbalanced manner over a long period of time, we may open the door for the enemy to bring sickness or disease into our life, or we may just simply suffer the consequences of our own actions, and Satan will add to that accusation of our own condemnation to condemn ourselves by what we're thinking so that we would condemn ourselves for not being self-disciplined in the first place. Many times when people are recovering from illness, they follow a strict diet that brings balance back into their eating habits. Find balance in all you do and keep the enemy away from your door. When God said for us to pray, he said, deliver us from evil. Simple. When evil comes, that is a direct assault. That's not Satan. It's an assault of evil. It's a garnishing of forces together to accomplish some purpose that's designed to attack in a specific way. So we need deliverance at that point in time. The sad part is, is that the rest of the time, we really need balance of the Word of God, focusing in on Jesus, doing the things that God wants us to do, and keeping everything in right relationship. At times there is preaching, you know, as we were talking about Calvary Chapel, at times there is teaching, like in home Bible studies and personal one-on-one -on -one with your children, you know, it's not dictating, do as I do, not as I say, you know, <laughs> or do as I say, not as I do, <laughs> you know, how does the kid figure out which one you do? By application of grace and mercy, see, well, son, you know, here, let me explain it to you. I try to do the best I can. And when I don't do the best, then God adds to me the grace that I need in order to survive my own personal choices that I have to pay for. Because for everything there is in action, I have to suffer the consequence of it so that I have to give an account to God for it. Just like you have to give an account to me for all your actions that you do until you're grown up and then you stand before God and have to do for your own actions. But while you live with me and while you're my child, I get to encourage you in learning how to take responsibility for your own actions, even as I take responsibility for mine, and then to ask mercy and forgiveness and grace to extend to others as well as to yourself so that you know that you're going to fall down because everybody fails at times. They fail seven times, the Bible says. And sometimes they fail regularly so many times that it drives people crazy that they just think that the person will never get it. And God says, hey, I'm going to get them to the place of being perfect one of these days, but you won't see it because it's going to take until the end of their life to be perfect. So really this whole process is just simply you learning to ask, to seek, and to know that God loves you in such a way that he's always going to be there for you because he sees everything you're trying to do and he helps you to do the things that you want to do as you choose to do the things that I'm telling you that you should do now even as I'm trying to do them myself. Hey, no problem. Kids pay attention for all that period of time, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> But the point is, teaching would be interactive, and you would make a point of not just sit there and preach it to them, but you would interplay with them. You'd say, hey, you know, let's play some games with this, you know, and then you'd, you'd work it out. But God doesn't play games with us. He wants us to accomplish his purposes by not giving credit to Satan and focus in on the devil, but rather give glory to God and give God his due thankful that he has brought you through by the grace of God that's been extended to your life, in your life, as you walk with him daily. All you really got to do is be real with God and let him be God. Because, frankly, I'll give the devil his due. He's a midget. <laughs>